so tell me, just map out the past year. Where have you been traveling? You you travel one one to two months with your wife. Where have you been going? So you're in Barcelona now. Why Bar- Why Barcelona? Barcelona now. Yeah, so I guess if we rewind a, a couple of years ago, you know, I used to have like a corporate job, nine to five, restricted us a lot. I uh, wasn't real happy with it. You know, I always had a mm-hmm. strong entrepreneurial spirit. Right. So about the time um, that I was able to kind of replace my income with selling on Amazon, we also, right. my wife and I took off and started traveling. Yeah. Um, so since then, we've been to, I don't know, a whole bunch of countries. Uh, usually about once a month or every other month or something, we'll uh, move to a different spot. Mm-hmm. So most of 2015 was spent in yeah. Southeast Asia and a little bit of mm-hmm. South America. Mm-hmm. And then uh, this summer, we're going to be in Europe. So we're in Barcelona right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm actually uh, going to Vietnam for a little while. And yeah, I don't know where I'm going at the end of 2016 yet. So, so. Barcelona, where were you before Barcelona? I was in uh, Rio in Brazil. Rio in Brazil. And then yeah. previous to that? Um, previous to that, uh, we went home to visit our families for the holidays a little bit. And then uh, before that, I was in Colombia and Southeast Asia. Mm. So what's the hardest part about running your business? I mean, it sounds amazing, right? I'm sure there's difficulties yeah. too from traveling. There's probably bad internet in places. What, what are the biggest challenges um, from running your business virtually and, and traveling every month? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so one of the good things is since I kind of started living this type of lifestyle at the same time that I was yeah. starting my businesses, um, my businesses have been developed, you know, with like systems in place to have a distributed team and everyone working remote and so forth. Yeah. So as far as like the communication and organization, that kind of stuff goes, it's pretty easy because we started that from the very beginning. You know, mm-hmm. we have we communicate through Slack. We have really good like project management in place and all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. So that's not a problem. Um I quickly learned about the internet thing is to, um, we always travel or one of the main things we look for in like the areas we're going to sell in is whether they have a good co-working space or not. So we always mm. work from co-working gotcha. spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Cause so you know, it's going to have good internet and exactly. Yeah. So if it's a co-working space they usually advertise internet speeds, but also same thing. It's, you know, um, it's an area people go to work. So you meet really cool people there. There's good internet. Uh, it's a good place to be creative and productive and so forth. Yeah. How many staff do you have? Um, so the jungle scout team is actually, uh, 16 people now. We wow, had a, a holy cow. First start yesterday. That's amazing. Yeah. So we're, we're growing pretty quickly. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we're, the team's distributed all throughout the world. Um, mostly actually in Vancouver though. So we have like, Interesting. I think nine people in Vancouver now, mm-hmm. but other than that, we're in San Francisco, uh, Toronto, New Brunswick in Canada, um, one guy in Sydney in Australia. Um, so yeah, we're kind of distributed around the world. Yeah. I'll do a formal intro, but um, so do those people also work on your Amazon business? Like, yes. cause I know you sell on Amazon also. Right. So my Amazon business is a little different. So you know, when I originally got started, it was just with the Amazon stuff. Yeah. Um, I had two full-time people working for me in uh, Maryland, which is mm. where I was originally from. What did they uh, do? One person was kind of just like a warehouse type guy, you mm-hmm. know, like unpacking, repacking, labeling and stuff. And the other one was like the project manager type. Yeah. Um, since then, I've been able to kind of shift that focus from that business from like reselling uh, wholesale items to all private label. Mm-hmm. And then so I've uh, been able to... Um, now we just have one part-time guy working on my Amazon FBA stuff. We, we've been able to like outsource a lot of the work to, uh, my freight forwarder. I use like, uh, the name of the company is Flexport. So now they like receive my shipments, they repack them there, ship them into Amazon. So that was a lot of the work. Mm-hmm. We've been able to systematize it really well yeah. so that, um, it's just, it's much more manageable. We've cut some of like our low performing products that didn't have good margins because it just wasn't worth it anymore. So really picking and choosing, um, you know, and that's, in that business, what makes the most money, what's worth working on and so forth. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of inspiredinsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. 
This is part of the e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Today we have Greg Mercer all the way from Barcelona. He's the founder of the software Jungle Scout, which allows you to quickly and easily perform product research on Amazon. And he's the founder of Review Kick, which helps people quickly and easily get reviews for their Amazon products. In addition, that weren't enough, Greg, uh, he generates revenues in excess of 400000 per month by selling products on Amazon. Greg, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm excited to hear your journey. and It's, it's really interesting because you're traveling all over the place. Um, and I like to hear first because it sounds luxurious. It sounds amazing. But I always like to know the backstory of what are some of the big mistakes you've made um, selling on Amazon? Yeah, good question. Um, so specifically with selling on Amazon, um, a few of, I guess one of the mistakes would be, especially when I was just getting started about not calculating like my true expenses and mm. true costs of all my different products. Like when I first started, I was selling, uh, I was reselling products that I was getting from wholesalers yeah. and that's a little bit like thinner margins than the kind of the business model I'm doing now, which is like private labeling type yeah. uh, products. Yeah. So especially when you have a whole bunch of products like uh, dozens or hundreds, um, it's easy to, I think, get stuck looking at like the big picture and not realize like, okay, I have a few products in here that are actually are losing me money each month. Mm. Uh, that was one of the uh, one of the mistakes I used to be kind of bad about. Um, How'd you figure that out eventually? Because again, there's like a lot of like shipping fees, Amazon fees. How did you end up find, you know, piecing together that this product is losing money? Yeah, so eventually it was just I had to dig deeper into my books and get better organized is, is really all it was. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So the true cost, what made you decide to start off with wholesale instead of – because I know that you've transitioned from wholesale to only doing private label pretty much, right? That's correct. So um, to be honest with you, the reason I didn't start off with private label is because I just didn't know about it or think about it. Um, you know, I – I saw a bunch of like established brands and products being sold on Amazon. I just kind of thought that's what everyone else was doing. Mm. Um, and after I was in it for a little while is when I started to pick up and see that a lot of people were uh, ordering products like Factory Direct, just private labeling them or white labeling them with their brands. Um, and that has some huge advantages on Amazon. You can get a lot better margins, mm -hmm. uh, a lot more control. Uh, and so forth. And, you know, obviously, since you're cutting out a, a middleman and getting it straight from the factory, you know, some cost savings there. So right. uh, yeah, that's certainly my preferred method now. Yeah. So I know it's taboo for people. People just don't t tell people what they sell on Amazon because uh -huh. they're worried people are going to knock it off, right? Is that sure? Yeah. So can you talk about what ones didn't work that you had to cut that were, were losing you money? Yeah. So. Uh, I guess just to be clear, those products were uh, some of the older products I was selling that I was yeah. getting from the wholesalers. So That's why I uh, you figure it's fair game to ask because you're probably yeah, not yeah, selling yeah. them anymore. <laughs> right. So those products were – I was selling a lot of like health and wellness type products mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them were the lower price stuff like just like different uh, bandages and just kind of like strange things like that. Um, so yeah, those are the ones that I was kind of cutting. Um you know, now I'm selling a lot of like patio lawn and garden type items. I've actually did like a public uh, product and a public launch of bamboo marshmallow sticks. Yeah, so, I saw yeah. that. I saw that video. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm talking about that for a second. Stuff. Yeah. So you decided to document this though. Yeah. Right. So, so that is, you know, like you said, with people selling on Amazon, um, a lot of people, especially in interviews or YouTube, whatever, they don't want to share their product because. If you teach someone exactly like what product you're selling, how much money it's making, it's pretty easy to copy. Um, so I, the downside of it, you know, is there was there was a certain amount of you know, like non-transparency in the industry about sure. what people were really selling. So yeah. um, I, and I recognize that, and I you know I wanted to help people with it. So we did launch a uh, you know publicly through like a series of webinars. We went through the whole process of how we pick items. Um, how we communicate with these factories in China and order them and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a really cool case study. Um, so the products, they're called jungle sticks. <laughs> uh, they're like three feet long, uh, little bamboo marshmallow sticks. Yeah. Uh, they sell for 20 bucks on Amazon. Uh, we get them from the factory for uh, $3 plus it's, it costs like $1.50 shipping to get them from China. Yeah. Uh, they're doing pretty well right now. 
Right now, I think it's kind of like peak season because it's springtime, but they're selling about eight or 900 a month. That's um, awesome. Yeah, so it's pretty good money. I think it's like over $4,000 a month in profit, and we're donating it all to uh, Doctors Without Borders. Wow. So it all goes to charity. So That's it's awesome. a pretty cool little project. Yeah, I'm having fun with it. So have anyone knocked it off yet since? Yeah. So have they actually, really? <laughs> we just did a blog post like two weeks ago about all of our competitors that have popped up. Uh, it's kind of oh, funny because like ours are called Jungle Sticks. There's one guy who like called his whole sticks. Like we spelled like S T I X. Uh, so it's like a direct knockoff, the exact same product, exact same packaging, everything. But wow. it's it's kind of um, just humorous now, you know. That it's, is it's kind of fun to joke on them on so the blog post. Do you do you do like a video of your competitors to call them out on on just completely yeah. knocking you off? <laughs> yeah. So if you go to our blog, you'll see it. And we're ranked like number one or number two for the term marshmallow sticks. Right. And we even go so far. He's like at the bottom of the page. So we even went, list out like all the things he's doing wrong. We're like, we know you're reading this whole sticks like. <laughs> <laughs> These are the things you need to change if you want to be up at the top with us. <laughs> so what was he doing wrong that he needed to improve on? Uh, it's just different things like where you place some of the keywords in the title. And he doesn't have very many reviews yet. And if he would get some more reviews, I'm sure to be ranked a little bit higher. So um, <laughs> so now the true test is to like look back, I guess, in a few weeks and see if uh, he changed those things or not. <laughs> so what is the, the uh, rule of thumb for keywords in the title for Amazon listing? Um, just, there's just kind of like general SEO practices, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, keywords that you want to rank for obviously should be in your title. The closer to the beginning is better. Yeah. Um, you don't with Amazon need to repeat keywords, uh, in your title that doesn't help you out. Just some little things like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you talked about the bandage. What was it about the, was there a pattern with the products that weren't selling well, that were losing money that you saw? Um, a lot of them were the lower price products. You really had to be careful with the fees on the lower price items because yeah. like the very – so Amazon does charge some flat fees through the FBA models. So they'll charge like a dollar to like a pick and pack your product for you from their warehouses. They yeah. charge like – another uh, dollar for some other type of like warehouse fees. So even if you're selling a really inexpensive, small, lightweight item, the minimum amount of fees are like something like three fifty or $4. Yeah. So on some of these lower price items are like eight, nine, ten dollars $10, you really have to be careful with those fees. And it's like you have to be getting your product for like pennies to be making money on it. Right. Um, so that was one of the common themes on the products that weren't doing well. So what made you decide to do this case study to just map it out even knowing that it was going to be a successful product and that people were going to knock it off? Um, really just because there wasn't anything out there like it. I yeah. knew that uh, it'd be like so helpful to our audience and everyone who followed along with it. Um, so yeah, just to kind of be like the first ones mm -hmm. in the industry doing like a totally public case study. Yeah. Um, and it was cool. Like People like love to follow along with it. Um, you know, great turnouts for all of our webinars and yeah. everything. So yeah, I think it was definitely a success and it's, we're still doing, it's, I guess, an, uh, ongoing case study. Cause now we're talking about like how we're optimizing our listing and yeah. changing our pay-per-click, um, and how the competition affects it yeah. and so forth. So it's cool. Okay. So people could go on and check out jungle sticks, marshmallows yeah. uh, on yeah. Amazon. Yeah, so if you go on Amazon, just search for jungle sticks or if you search for marshmallow sticks, we're usually in the top two or three spots or so. So what was second in the running? Because obviously you probably chose between a few things, right? Marshmallow yeah, sticks that you ended up going we, with. We narrowed it down to like four options. I think they were um, like film canisters, you know, that you'd put like old school film in. Mm. Uh, that that was seems one. weird. Why would anyone want that? Uh, there was, I didn't realize this till the webinar, but yeah. through the live chat and the webinar, there's speculation that uh, that's people like, where people store their marijuana. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. <laughs> I didn't realize that until the webinar. Yeah, but right. I, that's, no, what they, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm told. Um, we also had, I think, like pads for barbells if you're doing deadlifts, like they're, they're popular in CrossFit. Oh, so yeah. a whole just like hodgepodge of stuff. Uh, yeah. You know, we go with just whatever there's high demand and low competition for on Amazon. Yeah. You don't you don't have to create like a whole uh, brand that's, you know, uh, like in the same category or niche or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Because I know you. We'll we'll talk about that. Because I have a couple of questions. Because you have a couple of different brands under you know that you sell uh, on Amazon. But um, so how long have you been doing selling on Amazon, Greg? Uh, I guess it's 
over three years now. Wow. Uh, so it's pretty yeah. short time. You've ramped up pretty quickly. That's pretty yeah. amazing. Um, so I actually, I, yeah, um, it hasn't been too long. You can really like ramp it up pretty quickly um, if you can, if you have a little, I, probably the biggest thing holding people back from growing their uh, Amazon businesses is cash flow. It is fairly mm-hmm. cash intensive. Sure. You know, like you're paying um, up front for inventory that, especially if it's being shipped from China, it might take like a month to get there. You know, it might take another couple of months to sell. So that's usually what's holding people back is just like yeah. the lack of cash or cash flow. Yeah. Um, because other than that, it's a pretty like simple and straightforward process. You know, yeah. it's like once you learn how to do it with one product, uh, you know, so like Jungle Sticks are doing like uh, fifteen thousand dollars a month in revenue or something. So you know, if you were to do that ten times, you'd be doing one hundred fifty thousand a month, right? So it's right. not. Um, you just kind of you, mean, you make it sound easy. I know people selling on Amazon; they're not doing as well as you, and they've been doing it longer. Uh-huh. So, what do you think your superpower is? You- I've definitely come up, like I said, with like a a system that yeah. like I know works. That's yeah. uh, you know, um, it's kind of been proven like through my own product. So yeah. you know, I like I have some like rules of thumbs that I go yeah. by to like look for the demand, look for how much competition there is, and so forth. And like if you follow, and we've we've like laid all this out in these blog posts. Right. Anyone who's listening to this, you can just go on. It's like free. We're not. I'm not trying to sell you a course or anything. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's can, only ten thousand uh, dollars for your Jungle Scott <laughs> course now. um so i mean if you find a like find the products that meet all that criteria it really is um like not that difficult um the downsides are like i said is that you do have to spend some cash it's going to cost sure you know like if you go for smaller uh less expensive items you might be able to do it for like a thousand dollars but like pretty much minimum investments a few thousand dollars if you really yeah. want to I mean if you're them. saying if you're buying it for whatever four dollars the shipping it's five dollars if you're buying a thousand units at a time it could be five thousand dollars at a time right exactly so yeah. um, it's definitely not like a perfect opportunity it across kind of like 10 products to... that's fifty thousand dollars you know it adds up pretty quickly certainly yeah um, so yeah um, where should we I mean, some people I mean we'll link it up but um I want to talk a little bit about the system but have them they, if they want to get more detail where can they find that is it on the jungle scout blog or where, where yeah, should they exactly look right so just jungle scout.com slash okay. blog because uh, I watched it I think on YouTube so. I think it's on YouTube also right yeah 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 I'm sure if you were to search uh, like jungle scout yeah. case study on YouTube you'd find it there too so talk briefly about the system so obviously you start off with jungle scout Right, so you're you're reviewing products. Where do you go, and what do you what are you looking for, initially? Sure. So, um, yeah, I look for products that have an existing demand on Amazon. So, a lot of times, especially like beginners, I'll hear them say like, "Oh, I have a, like an idea for like a really cool product or like a new invention or so forth." Um, and that's fine if you really want to go down that route. However, in my opinion, that's pretty risky. Right. Um, you're like, if you, you it, can do that, but you're going to lose a lot of money, is what you're saying. <laughs> well, you just, it, it, the idea just hasn't been like validated. It could potentially be like the, the best idea ever, but right. there's a lot of risk with that. So instead, I just look for products that, um, you know, there's already existing demand. People are already going to Amazon.com every day, making the search. You know, like I know every day people are going to Amazon.com, searching for marshmallow sticks and buying them on there. Right. So, it, you know, it wasn't very risky. Um, so you might say, okay, yeah, there's tons of products that have high demand, but then you have to find the ones that have kind of low competition because yeah. then you can enter into these markets. So, yeah. um, you know, if, if we're talking hard numbers, I like to find um, – 3,000 units of demand total across all the products in the niche. So like yeah. the top 10 sellers for marshmallow sticks, I like if I would add up demand, it'd be like 3,000. Right. Uh, competition, the easiest way to determine competition is how many reviews the products have. So yeah. like old, mature, very competitive niches will have right. tons of reviews. So if I go there and the top sellers yeah. have like thousands of reviews, that's very difficult to enter into. Yeah. Whereas if you make a search and most of the listings only have like 20, 30, 50 reviews, something like that, that's yeah. something that you can easily get into. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then other than that, once you found something that met those criteria, I'd just be looking for something that had good margins. So yeah. um, once you've found something that kind of meets all that criteria, that's something that, um, I mean, it's 
it's kind of like a proven system that it works. You just have to find those products. And of course there's, you know, I, I'm making it sound really easy. Of yeah. course, then you have to find a, a You've talked group. about Alibaba. I know that you yeah, kind of certainly. will message and try and find trustworthy factories and places. Are there any other places besides Alibaba that you recommend people look? Yeah, you can do a global sources.com. Mm-hmm. That's like similar to Alibaba. Mm-hmm. Uh, they specialize more in um, like electronics or kind of like higher tech type items, yeah. but it, it's just like Alibaba too. Yeah. Actually, the the um, factories and manufacturers on global sources are a little better vetted than Alibaba. So mm-hmm. it's like, I guess, probably a little safer as well. Yeah. And just so people know, Greg, you know, when you're talking about this, this is easily visualized with Jungle Scout. Like if anyone has used it, it's um it, it's like a chrome extension it's an extension you can basically when you search a keyword i'll explain it you could if i butcher it let me know um, <laughs> but you you just put a keyword in amazon and actually you click the you know the little icon at the top the jungle scout and basically it appears on that page for each seller what they're selling per month what they're making you know per month and so like when you're saying you know look at the reviews look at the product sold you're basically looking at the Jungle Scout uh, extension open, and it's showing all those that data, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, okay. um, you know, like I'm an engineer by background, I'm like a data guy. Like I said, I don't like to go about my gut feeling in these risks. I like right. to go by the data. So that's kind of how Jungle Scout was born. You know, it gives you all the relevant and key data points you need to make educated decisions. How did you decide on how to price Jungle Scout? Ah, good question. Pricing's really tough. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when I first launched jungle scout, it was like a very like minimalistic MVP type version. Yeah. Uh, and it was originally priced at like 50 bucks. Yeah. Um, but keep it in mind, you know, it was like stripped down a lot from what it is now. Yeah. And, um, essentially after that, so I started low and then after that, I just talked to my audience, like how much value does this give you? Yeah. You know, um, what would you, what kind of improvements would you like to see? And I go from there yeah. and pretty much what I got from people is, it provides a tremendous amount of value. You know, one of these products can make you thousands and thousands of dollars a month, right? So yeah. they're like, okay, well, even for a hundred or some people were telling me even for like 500 bucks or whatever, it's still like well worth it because yeah. even if I were to spend $500, if it make, finds me or it shows me the products to make thousands, then it's like kind of a no brainer. Right. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I don't, uh, I wish I had a good like system. It may be place, subject but, to change obviously, but what does it cost now for someone to get it? Yeah, so we actually have like uh, Jungle Scout has like two different products. One's the extension that you kind of went over. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like ninety or one hundred fifty bucks a month. There's two versions of it, and then our other product's a web-based, uh, more conventional like SaaS type product, mm. and it is a monthly fee between forty and one hundred dollars a month. So what's the difference between the two of them? The, are are yeah. they different, or are they just on a yeah. different? Okay, they're very much different. Um, I'll just give you a quick like one minute crash course yeah. on it. Um, so the web-based app. It has a few different features, but it will it essentially uh, gives you product ideas. So, like my mm, favorite feature gotcha. is called Product Database. Yeah, you can filter through the Amazon catalog to show you the products that say like mm. uh, sell over three hundred a month, yet have less than fifty reviews or less than two pounds, over twenty dollars. All those like metrics, it will spit out all those products. So then maybe now I have a few thousand products. I can go through there look at them on the Amazon store and that's when you can use our other product, the Chrome extension. And that's kind of what you were talking about it after you make a search. So after I search for marshmallow sticks or plastic, whatever, then it gives you all that data. So, um, that's kind of the crash course on it. Of course, if you're interested in finding out yeah. more, it's on the website. I make no affiliate commission off this, but I, I definitely <laughs> use the product and it's really, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, and I remember thinking this Greg, when I originally saw it, I must've saw it when it first came out. I'm like, how is this only fifty dollars? Like, is there some <laughs> catch here? Is, and I'm like, why is he not charging a monthly fee? I'm like, I'm right. not gonna tell him that because then he'll start charging a monthly fee. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. now it's like, depending on the usage, it's like forty to hundred per month for for each of them. Um, so the extension still actually is a one-time fee, oh, yeah. just for ninety or one hundred fifty bucks. You get oh, it one uh, time. pay okay. once and keep it forever. The other one where I was talking about the product database and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's run like off our server, so it is a uh, monthly fee is more uh, relevant yeah, for that yeah. one. So um, why not the SaaS for the extension? Um, I always I was thinking that I'm like, why doesn't he just charge like five bucks a month because people are continuing to use it as opposed to the one time one time fee? Yeah, is it's there- a good question. Um, 
And looking back, I may have done it differently. However, um, I think it worked out really well because since it is like inexpensive and just a one-time fee, I think it's like a real low barrier of entry for people. You know, um, they can get into it. it's like a, a no-brainer purchase, right? Um, and then after that, I think it's um, it, it worked out really well to kind of like grow our community and grow our audience to where we're at today. You know, yeah. since it is like everyone now, if you watch other YouTubes or read and Reddit, it's like, oh, you're looking at starting getting started on Amazon. Just first, just buy Jungle Scout. It's a no brainer. Like it's cheap. It, you know, it's worth a hundred right. times that. Um, so it worked out really well for just kind of yeah. like growing a community. Um, yeah. 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 No, I just, I worry more from the company standpoint of, you know, you right. have to keep it up. You have to make updates. Things change. It's got to be a pain in the butt to just do a one-time fee. And then you're updating it across all platforms. I don't know. What's the, what's the challenge of the software side of things? You have 16 people working on Jungle Scout. Right. And then that would probably be more now that, you know, we do have um, another product that is a SaaS, a monthly fee. That really helps, you know, kind of like pay the bills for yeah. like all of our staff and the updates to the extension and everything. So now the extension is, um, if you were to look at like our total workload, the extension is a very smaller amount. So even if, even if we were able to kind of like separate it out, yeah. even if it wasn't profitable, it'd still be okay because we still have a now large team that can easily support it and, um, yeah, it helps to get kind of people into our community and audience. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I want to go back a little bit before Amazon because this is a short stint where you've built up a pretty big business. Um, mm -hmm. And I always like to include a fun fact. And um, I guess you, you gave me two. <laughs> Your wife would say that you sing strange songs out of the shower. So, <laughs> I don't know if I'll ask you at the end to sing one of those. But um, <laughs> And then you have an interesting mm -hmm. workflow. You like to take off four hours in the middle of the day and work in the evening. Um, is there a reason for that? Do you find that you're more productive at certain times of the day or just just because you're traveling all the time? Oh, well, I, I don't know. I think maybe because I used to like work in the corporate world and I used to always hate that like I was working all of the daylight hours. So I guess I kind of say like if I ever like work for myself – you know, I'm really productive in the mornings and then like in the after after lunch, let's take some advantage of some of the sunlight, like, you know, right. do some activities outside, that sort of thing. And then when it's dark out in the nights, that's when I can go back to work. Um, so, yeah, that's it works. It works out really well for me. Um, and I found that I'm hyper productive because of it. Yeah. I want to go back. So where are you from originally? Originally from Maryland. Maryland. OK. So yeah. I, what was a big influence for you growing up? From a business standpoint or yeah, from what? It could be either. Yeah. Because um, you have a I'll, certain mindset, right? And you have a certain mindset of you're always thinking systems and then you've built up the Amazon business and start the software business. And that comes from something. So I'm wondering if there was a, you know, what would the influences were if you had a mentor early on? Sure. So if I had to say a mentor would be my dad. Uh, he's an entrepreneur himself. Hmm. Um, he runs a uh, e-commerce company. He does. So that, okay. Yeah. That, it probably inspired me to get into a little bit. Um, but actually, it's kind of funny. I didn't realize this until the other day, but uh, I started my first business before my parents even started theirs. Really? Um, yeah, so I've like had this strong entrepreneurial spirit my whole life, and I'll just tell a 30-second story yeah, go, of it. Yeah, go for it sure. Was, um, <laughs> so I was probably I was thinking I was how did you discover this the other day were you talking to your parents or something or what yeah I was I was talking up? to them okay uh, yeah tell me what they said how much I love it so yeah it was um I was I was 14 years old and I had they're called go peds it was like a scooter with a little motor on the back of it you know yeah yeah so oh, for sure because uh, yeah. I couldn't drive yet so my parents I probably had to like beg them for two years to get this thing um uh and some of my friends you know they lived like a 20 or 30 minute bike ride away. So I really wanted this motorized go pad. Like this was like freedom for me. Um, but anyway, I saw a, um, an opportunity with these go pads is they didn't have a key. Like anyone could just go over there, you know, like pull the little rope and get the mm. engine started and drive it off. So I was like, I really want to install a key. So I installed a key on my really? go pad. How did you do that? Um, it was really simple. I mean, that seems like, pretty technical. To it was actually just like a, a switch that would disconnect the little kill switch. Oh, wow. So um, pretty simple. All I, it was really just a key switch from Radio Shack at the time that cost like three bucks. Mm. Um, so I repackaged these, put a little set of instructions with it. I bought the $3 switch from Radio Shack <laughs> and uh, started to resell these for $20. 
And my, my distribution channel, my marketing channel was, I went to the GoPed website, found all the authorized dealers. Really? And <laughs> that's pretty smart. Yeah. At the time I printed out like a, uh, promotional sheet and I sat there at my parents' fax machine and I'd type in one person's <laughs> distributor number. I'd send them the fax and then I'd pull it back out. I'd type in the next one. I'd send one fax at a time. Wow. So I did that for like hundreds of people. You were cold. The, it wasn't cold email. You were cold faxing <laughs> I was, people. I was cold faxing people. And uh, I, I sold like, I forget my, that first week I sold hundreds and hundreds of these things. My wow. mom drove me around to all the radio shacks in like a, a one hour driving radius. And we bought out the store of all the, uh, the key. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> And that, that was my first company. So why did it stop? It sounds like people are going to continue yes. to make these motorized things. So this is a, uh, this is a good ending to this story <laughs> is my company name was called PedKey. And when I say That's company. a great like, name actually. Did you get the <laughs> website for that? I had the website, but after like four or five months, GoPed, uh, I got a nice letter, a cease and desist letter from their lawyers saying they had the trademark on a uh, PED. <laughs> really? Yeah, so, so like, like pedestrian. I mean, like, how do they have a trademark right, yeah. on pet? I think were they messing think, with you? I mean, <laughs> probably. But at the time, like, I was 14 years old. Like, I got a letter from a lawyer. I was like, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have any legal structure set up. Like, uh, <laughs> like I just ask people to mail me checks, and I go to the bank, I ride my GoPed to the bank, and deposit them. Um, so I don't know. And then I probably just got distracted with playing. Wow, sports with my friends or something. I don't so know what you, happened. Did you own the domain pedkey.com? I do. You, I, I, do you I still did. own it? I, did. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Wow. It's fun. We should go back in the, um, what's that called? The way like, back uh, machine? Yeah, I wonder if it's in there. <laughs> Maybe someone owns it now. That's a, that's a fantastic domain. Yeah. So, so your dad is in e-commerce. What kind of company? Is, um, they, he does um, different health and medical type products. Um, so he has a series of, uh, e-commerce stores, like traditional e-commerce stores. Okay. So what did you learn from him? Um, I learned from him probably a good work ethic. He was always working hard. Um, I learned that, um, that in order to kind of create freedom, whether it's like financial freedom mm -hmm. or freedom of your time and life and so forth, that you need to get out of the corporate type world, you know, mm -hmm. exchanging your dollars for hours and instead uh, set up investments and companies and so forth. Uh, so that was one of the good things I learned from him. Um, and probably, I, I think I, you know, looking back, I think I learned a lot from him just because like him and my mom were always chatting business just like over dinner at night, you know, they'd mm -hmm. be like, What'd you kids do today? And then it would kind of get like off track and then they'd start talking about business. And at the time, I probably just thought it was so boring. Like didn't really care. But looking back, you I probably learned confused. a lot of good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So at the time, you said you were the first entrepreneur. Were they in – was your dad in a corporate job before he started the e-commerce? Yep, that's so exactly right. So do you know why – what made him start the e-commerce? Uh, he got laid off. Oh, wow. So that was like – that would have been like uh, 2000. Um, he was working for, I don't know, some kind of consulting, I think in the, uh, tech world or something yeah. that was during the, the big bust or whatever there. And, right. uh, yeah, he got laid off. Um, and I think that's when he decided to give, uh, the whole entrepreneurship thing yeah. a try. Yeah. He could have just easily got a job though. Yeah, absolutely. But I he... think, uh, looking back, I'm pretty sure he had like an awesome severance package, like a year or something ridiculous. So it's like, Hey, if you're going to ever try it, now's the time. Right. So Greg, tell me the day you quit your corporate job. Um, so that would have been like six months after I started selling on Amazon. So I guess mm. that was like maybe two and a half years ago now or something. Um, and at that point I had replaced my income from my sales on Amazon. Um, after just so, after just a few months, yeah, just after a few wow. months, um, you were an engineer, right? I was. I was a yeah. civil engineer. Uh huh. Okay. Um, and it was scary, <laughs> but uh, man, looking back, like I wish I would have done it sooner. You know, uh, that was like the best decision I've ever made. So what made you? It is scary, right? And yeah. even if you I, replace your income, you could you're still thinking, well, this is only six months in, right? So what right. was that decision to to do it? Um, I, 
I guess I just wasn't very like fulfilled or happy at my other job. You mm. know, it's like by like American textbook standards, I lived like what you call the perfect life, right? Like I had a house in the suburbs and worked like a decent paying nine to five job and all that stuff. I wasn't really very fulfilled or happy with life. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that's when I was like, I really want to do my own thing. I had this strong entrepreneurial fire. Um, yeah. And then I didn't really know where it was going to take me. I was like, man, I don't know if I'm going to be selling on Amazon a year from now, but I'm, I'm making an, enough cash that I feel comfortable quitting. I'll just figure the rest right. out. Did you have a number in your mind when you started it? Like when I hit this number, I'm quitting? Or were you not even in your radar because it ramped up so quickly? Um, so actually my <laughs> my wife was like, if you can make $100 a day in profit, then like quit your job. Because she was very skeptical, of course, right? Yeah, yeah. She was like, I don't know. Um, I mean she had, a, she had a good paying job also. So, uh, But she was like, if you can – you know, because I had all these ideas. I'm like, I can make money from this and this and that. She's like, if you can actually show me like you're making $100 a day, like I'll be all for you quitting. Go for it. Give it a try. So that, yeah. that was the number. She's like, if you kept pen key, we'd be retired right now. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm so kidding. laughs> I've actually never told uh, that pen key story live. So That's that a was great fun. Story. I'm missing on that. I yeah. love that. Um, you know, for that, when you decide to, to quit and it's a, it's a tough decision, right? Tell me uh, a little about the trajectory um, of selling on Amazon. Did you have mentors early on or how did you even learn the business? Um, I didn't really have any good mentors. Hmm. I, um, really just, I didn't really take any like courses or anything really just from, uh, like, trial and error, like reading online, whatever I could and so forth. Uh, thankfully Amazon's not like super complicated. Yeah. Uh, pretty much like if you can source a good product at the right price, the rest is pretty easy. Yeah. Um, so thankfully it wasn't too tough to figure out. Yeah. So talk about the trajectory, like that starting to when you quit, how many products were you selling and what, what approximately were you bringing in? Yeah. So at the time I think I was, I was selling a whole bunch of products, um, at the time cause I was reselling from wholesalers, but they were like, most of them weren't moving that fast or like kind of had low margins. So yeah. I, I don't know when I quit, maybe I had like 30, 40, 50 products, but some would only sell like one a week and I'd make yeah. like five bucks off it. Right. And then yeah. others were like doing okay. Um, so yeah, at one point this would have been like two years ago. I had probably had like three or 400 products. Um, but lo most of them weren't the private label products. There were the other ones I was reselling from wholesalers and they yeah. were, uh, low margin type products. So kind of you transition where I'm at today, I've got rid of most of those. Now I'd only have like, I think I have around like 35 or 40 products, but they're all move a lot, like minimum, sell minimum 300 a month and have good margins. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a lot of work, Greg. I mean, a product and the way you do it with the descriptions, it, I mean, or is it not? So it's a lot of work to get started. It's yeah. to like find and vet the factories. Yeah. You had 400 oh. products. So I mean, that's like. No, no. So that was like at one point. That was at like a couple right. of years ago. Right. Yeah. 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 At that point, it was logistically much more complicated. Um, and that's when I like at one point sat down and like looked at my business like, okay, like it's not worth focusing any time or effort on these products that aren't really making me that much money. Yeah. Yeah. So like today, like with my private label products, it's a little bit of uh, work to get started because yeah. like you said, you have to write the descriptions, find a factory, all that kind of stuff. But after you launch a product, it is very easy. Um, like I said, I use a freight forwarder. So now literally all I do is every like month or two months when I'm getting low, I just like, email my factory, uh, place a new order. They ship it to uh, the warehouse in LA. That's my freight forwarder. My freight forwarder forwards it on to Amazon and Amazon does the rest. So after you get these private label products set up, it's like no work at all. Yeah. I mean, one person can easily manage 40 products in like 10 hours a week. Once, once they're set up, it's a little bit of work to get them set up, but um, yeah. How often do you release new products now? Because I mean, I could think you could go crazy. You could probably spend 10 hours looking on, you know, Jungle Scout and be like, okay, I'm just gonna release all these products, right? So, right. What, what, yeah, do you, so what do you aim for? So now I'm doing, um, so 
me personally, I actually only spend maybe like one or two hours a week on my actual mm -hmm. physical goods, Amazon products now. Mm -hmm. And that's mostly communicating with um, someone I've hired that's like my manager for that uh, area now. Mm -hmm. um, but we're launching like one or two products a month, I'd say. Yeah. So you're uh, more so focused really on the software stuff. Yeah, so I'm more focused on the software now. And I, someone was asking me the other day why that is. Right. And uh, to be completely honest with you, I could probably make more money off selling the products on Amazon instead of the software. Yeah. But for me, um, I stopped really caring about the money much like a long time ago. I figure like to me, once you get to a certain point, for me, it's probably like sixty or seventy thousand dollars a year in profit. Like more than that, like I don't really care about because I don't, I don't have like very expensive tastes, you know. Yeah. Um, to me, that's like plenty of money to live off of. So after that, it's just about like what's the most fun or like yeah. what do I like spending my time on most. So for me right now, it's the software stuff. It's newer because I've only been in it for like a year and a half. Yeah, it's really exciting. It's really fun. Like how fast we're growing. Like the team we've put together is like awesome like we'd all be friends even if we didn't work together it's like super high energy and exciting and like everyone's having so much fun so um to me that's like where i enjoy spending my time greg what have you not expected with the software business uh, what surprised probably, you yeah so like i said before i hadn't been in software and i think anyone who had is the biggest misconception is um how expensive and like difficult it is to create software. You have so, 16, I mean, to give perspective, right? You have <laughs> over 400,000 a month in revenue and you have like a half an employee-ish yeah. for, <laughs> for right. that, right? And then you're torturing yourself on the other side. You have 16 <laughs> staff. Right, yeah, that's a good point. I never thought about that. <laughs> that's pretty wild. That is pretty wild. Um, so. So, yeah, well, yeah, anyways, uh, I interrupt software. you because I'm just like, it blows my mind a little bit. So, what surprised right. you? Yeah. Um, yeah, just how much uh, like detail is required for software. Like, I never would have thought about before I got into the industry, like all of the different, say, like errors you have to expect. And then there needs to be like error messages mm -hmm. written for all of them. And if, if everything worked perfectly in software, it wouldn't be that much work, but you have to plan for all the things that don't work well. Yeah. Um, you know, whether it's like backups be ready when your server fails or uh, this or that and the other thing. Um, so, you know, I think since like a lot of these big companies like Google and so forth, they have um, like free software. I think a lot of people are like under the impression that, oh, it's probably like really inexpensive or whatever. Um, and I was kind of like that too. I'm not going to yeah. lie. So yeah. that'd be the biggest thing I didn't expect was just how, how uh, yeah. time consuming, difficult and expensive it is to create software. Yeah. So wh what's baked into Jungle Scout? One, because of your experience of what you were looking for. And then two, I'm sure you get tons of feedback from people and they want all sorts of features and, and things like that. What's baked in early on that you're like, okay, I need it to do this because this is important for my product research because that's where it, where it came out of, right? From your need to do faster research. Yep. And um, yeah, that's exactly right. So like Jungle Scout is a product research software and we decided early on that we we're going to stay in that particular niche for uh, Jungle Scout. Just go a mile deep, be the best in the industry. Um, you know, Jungle Scout is where people turn when they're doing product research. So yeah. you're right, we do get um, requests all the time, you know, like, hey, can it do this and that or whatever? Um, and instead of trying to be like a Swiss Army knife that does 100 things but nothing very well, yeah. um, instead we just want to be like the product research tool that's just awesome at finding a product to sell on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And so what did you bake in that original product? Like, cause you could, you could include product research, a lot of different metrics in there. What did you want to make sure that you knew was in there? Yeah. Um, so our one, like our secret sauce would be our sales estimate. So Amazon doesn't release how many units, uh, a product sells like mm. publicly for all the products. They do, however, release something called the best sellers rank, which mm -hmm. They just rank all the products in their catalog from one to whatever, 10 million. Yeah. Uh, so what we've been able to do is create algorithms that estimate how many units a product sells. So mm. if you think about it, uh, so we follow like 100 or more, almost like 200,000 products now. We track their sales and their that rank each day. And then from there, we can um, 
develop algorithms to estimate how many units a product on Amazon mm. sells. Really so interesting. even even though Amazon doesn't release that data, we have these numbers that are pretty darn close, like plenty close enough to do forecasting and product research, or, you yeah. know, make educated purchasing decisions. Yeah. What's feedback you've gotten from customers that allowed you to change the product? Yeah, so it's cool. So, you know, we started from this very minimalistic just Chrome extension, right, that you yeah. were talking about earlier on. Yeah. Um, and Jungle Scout, where it is at today is like 99% of it's based off customer feedback. You know, we just um, – we're, we're pretty good about – uh, like reaching out to our customers, like surveying them um, or just, you know, whenever send, someone sends in an email, uh, we document like what they are looking for and so forth. We'll kind of grade that on the most requested features and so forth. And if right. it fits to our, um, you know, product map of sticking in the product research. And if so, yeah. that would be kind of like the next thing we build. So, um, so it's awesome, you know. It's it's just built on what are what the people want. Give yeah. the people what they want. <laughs> so what has been what was the most requested that you didn't even think about until people were were giving you feedback on it? A lot of it's just like the like the small like silly things like on the extension early on someone's like, well, you know, like why don't you have averages on here so like we can easily look at it. It's like I have no idea that would that's not hard to add. Uh, it provides a ton of value. Like I don't know why I didn't think about that, right? So a lot of it's just that simple stuff that um, you know, you, you don't think about until there's extra sets of eyes on it or people using it. Yeah. So on the Amazon side of things, Greg, what's what are some of the biggest mistakes people make with their with their listings? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, just in general, selling on Amazon, the biggest mistake people make are trying to get into too competitive uh, niches. Mm. So if you um, if you get in, say. A good example is like a garlic press or a yoga mat. If you try to sell one of those and you're like brand new starting out and like a brand new listing, it's extremely difficult to get on the first one or even two pages. So essentially you're just like lost in the back of Amazon's yeah. catalog. You'll like never make any sales and it's really difficult to get out of that. Um, so that's the biggest mistake. That's like the easiest way to kind of like fail at the model is to go into something too competitive. Yeah. And like I said, to prevent that, uh, the best thing to do is just just look at the number of reviews. Like if I were to search garlic press right now, all those top sellers would have like 500, 800, 1,000 reviews. And that that just signifies it's a very mature and competitive niche that yeah. uh, is really difficult to get into. So as long as you don't get into something too competitive. So if we go on the opposite end of the spectrum, yeah. something that has like no competition but say like little demand, yeah, you still probably – I wouldn't – you're probably not going to be considered like a failure – it wouldn't be like a failed product probably. It probably just wouldn't move as fast as you'd want. So right. maybe you were hoping that all your inventory would turn over in two months. Instead, it takes like six months. Well, yeah, like so instead you probably just learned a good lesson. You eventually made your money back. It just took a little bit longer than you expected. Mm -hmm. uh, so like, you know, early on I had some of those products that I don't really consider like failures. They just, um, you know. They're not blockbuster hits. Yeah, they weren't doing as much volume as I had hoped. See, I would have never guessed that a garlic press would be that competitive. What are some other like really competitive things that you would never get into because it's so competitive? Yeah, some of, some of the other things are like um, – it's funny. Like they're like silicone grill gloves, um, a lot of like – a lot of other like silicone stuff like spatulas and measuring cups and that kind of stuff. And I think it's because a lot of that stuff can be ordered from China for like a quarter. Yeah. It sells on Amazon for like 15 bucks, you know, like a set of like measuring cups. So the margins are incredible, right? Yeah. But um, that's why everyone's – that's why there's just tons of people selling yeah. on. Yeah. I would never guess that is popular. And that, that's true from just from your research. So you're, you know, when I ask the biggest mistakes, it sounds like you go to the very beginning. People make the biggest mistakes in the very beginning, either picking a product that's too competitive or that's just not selling well. Yeah. So like the product research phase is so critical because um, I guess it's kind of like if you're into like real estate investing, like you make your money, like when you buy it, it's kind of like similar with uh, Amazon stuff because if you pick a good product, you can, you know, like if you set up like a bad listing, you can always take new pictures or adjust your listing or do whatever you want, you know? Um, so it's all in like the product research phase on like how well the product's going to do because yeah, like you can make unlimited amount of edits to your listing, 
um, adjust your pricing down the road, whatever you need to do, as long as like, um, you know, to eventually make it successful, as long as you pick a good product that has potential. Yeah. And then from what I gather from the research, your criteria is some sweet spot that had, like you were saying, it's got uh, in the first whatever amount of page, you don't want people having thousands of reviews. You want them having, you know, a smaller amount of reviews. Ideally, you want it like a, a couple thousand units um, for that, that whole page. And you mm -hmm. want a lightweight, you want um, something that's, you know, not really low, but not really high. So maybe like 20 to $50. What else am I missing that you look for in a product to sell? Um, the only other things that would be uh, from like a legal or liability standpoint, like mm. you wouldn't, so like a factory in China will gladly sell you a t-shirt with um, like an NFL sports team or like Mickey Mouse or like these products that are supposed to be licensed, yeah. but then you'll get the, the same letter you got when you were 14. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'd stay away from those. Um, I would stay away from products that are like potential high liability. Um, say for instance, like I don't know, like a blowtorch or even maybe like knives or something. Things that are easy for people to hurt themselves on. I would, if I was you, I'd probably try to veer away from those. But mm -hmm. those are the only other real things I look for in the criteria. Yeah. So from a brand standpoint, how do you, and I get, I've gotten this question, I've talked to people about this. If they have different genres of products, you can set up different brands under Amazon, right? Yeah, What's certainly. What's your mentality with that, with uh, different brands? So um, my experience and my mentality is when people are searching on Amazon, they um, are generally, at least for like the type of products I'm selling, not very like brand loyal or they're not searching for particular brands, especially because mine are like private label brands that they haven't really heard of. So um, for instance, if you were searching for a garlic press or marshmallow sticks or uh, yoga mat or whatever else, you probably don't type into the search bar like a brand of garlic press, right? You just search for garlic press if you're looking for it. Right. Um, so because of that, I, I found that, you know, like people aren't searching for my brands. So it doesn't really matter if I have a whole bunch of products in the same brand. They're just searching for my particular product. Right. Um, you know, like, so my marshmallow sticks, the brand's called Jungle Sticks. Um, if I was also selling, uh, let's come up with another example, like, um, I don't know, like something you put in your yard, like some other kind of like stick, I don't know. Um, you know, someone's not going to find those together. They're just searching for the, yeah. the type of product that they're looking for when they go to Amazon. So because of that, I don't think it's that important to set up a brand that all of the the products are like coherent and seem to go together. I just go for the best opportunities and that's it. Yeah. So all this sounds like an upward trajectory, right? What's been the toughest part? Um, so of course, you know, like I've hit little road bumps along the way, right? Um, with, let's see. Which business in particular are you interested in? The, the software stuff or do, the physical goods stuff? Do the physical goods first because I okay. know the software, you're going to have a slew of stories. For that. <laughs> <laughs> um, with the uh, the physical goods stuff, um, some of the kind of problems I've run into or I've run into like some quality control problems. For instance, yeah. like a few months ago, I got – I placed an order of like 2,000 units and when they packed the boxes in the cartons, so you know, they're packing like 20 boxes into a master carton, like the ink on the boxes was still wet, so it's smeared like on the box next to it. Hmm. Um, so now I have like 2,000 units of boxes that all are smeared. Um, hmm. I just run into like little roadblocks like that, but that's to be expected with any business right you're gonna hit speed bumps along the way and what's more important is you just learn from them and um keep pushing forward so is that a relationship management thing with the manufacturer or do you have someone on the grounds there um if it's in china or wherever to to see the quality control how do you manage that yeah so um now what i've been doing is uh, for product, so for instance, like mar bamboo marshmallow sticks are pretty hard to mess up. Um, so I'm not like as concerned with it, but like on some of my products that have more moving parts or, uh, aren't quite as simple. Now I'll get like an inspection done before they put them in, uh, 
before they ship them from the factory. Um, and that's especially the case like for brand new factories that I haven't worked with before. If I have like a really good relationship with a factory, this is like the 15th order I've placed with them. It's not quite as important to do that kind of stuff. But um, yeah. yeah, especially with a newer factory. Yeah. So toughest times with um, the software side of things. Um, Managing 16 people and uh, bugs. What, what's been the toughest with the uh, Jungle Scout? Probably the toughest part is like as your company grows, um, I've had a tra- – so, you know, at the very beginning, like I was doing a little bit of everything, right? From like yeah. customer support to uh, product development to whatever. Um, and I guess with Jungle Scout, for me, the toughest part or kind of now, once your company grows, you have to move from – like the day-to-day operations more to like over uh, oversight. And I found now that a lot of my, or at least some time spent on now like legal matters and like trademarks and like things like that, you know, that, um, you know, it definitely uh, shifts from, you know, worrying about like replying to customers emails to now like i'm worrying about like these legal issues and you know, these other kind of funny things so um it's just kind of i guess the you know company's growing i have to grow as a leader with it and so forth yeah. how do you grow as a leader with the remote team yeah how do so, you manage a remote team because that's not it's it's you know that's a big challenge too it is um i think we've done really well with it though um i get a lot of I guess the good thing is, you know, I'm not doing this alone. A lot of like big and popular companies now are doing this yeah. as well. Companies like uh, Buffer and there's like Groove and Automatic who makes WordPress. Yeah. Uh, I, actually, I learned quite a bit from like reading their blogs. Yeah. They, they blog a lot about having a distributed team and yeah. like management. And, um, you know, we're not all in the same office to like high five to celebrate when something goes well. So, right. you know, we have to like figure out other ways to celebrate together as a team and uh, so forth. So um, we do one thing that's really cool, like three or four mm. times a year where um, everyone flies into a central location yeah. and we do like a week long, we call it jungle camp. Um, so we were in Rio, like at the beginning of this year, we're meeting in Vietnam um, in a couple of months or awesome. next month. Yeah. Um, so that's really fun. And we just kind of do things like that. And what do you do? Is it um, very structured or do you just go on? Is it their business and pleasure or? Yeah, so we'll do like business and pleasure. So we'll usually try to like release something big or have a big event happening at the same time as that week. Uh, we also just have fun together, just get to know each other more on like a personal level. Yeah. Um, so it's a nice combination. This time we're starting something new where uh, each person is going to propose uh, just something to help our company grow or help us have a better relationship with our audience. Yeah. So that could be something philanthropic, philanthropic or um, – it could be just a a growth idea or whatever. So everyone's kind of like putting some work together to uh, present that to the whole team. So that's gonna be really cool. Um, yeah. So we just. So Greg, know. it seems like a lot of people, uh, the softwares are in Vancouver, right? So why Vancouver? Yeah. So it's actually just because our first developer was hired in Vancouver. Yeah. Um, I've learned good developers are really hard to find right. because they're in such high demand. Yeah. So. <laughs> So most of our dev team has just been through their network. So, you know, like he hired one of his buddies and then they go to the Ruby on Rails meetup in Vancouver and they tell everyone, hey, we're working for this really fun company that's growing really quickly. We need two more people. So it's all yeah. we've hired more developers through their networks and yeah, friends that's and really so cool. forth. So that, that's the only reason that we have a, quite a few people in Vancouver. Yeah, that's great. Um, resources and software you use to manage the Amazon business. You mentioned, obviously use Jungle Scout, right? Uh-huh. You mentioned Flexport, um, Global Sources, Ali, you know, Alibaba. What else, what other resources or software to use to manage the, the Amazon business? Yeah, so we recently launched another little uh, platform called Review Kick, and that's yeah. a way to uh, get reviews on your product. Mm-hmm. So you can give away your product at a discount uh, to, to like, just real buyers on Amazon. You give them a coupon code and in exchange, they leave you a review for your product. Um, so that's pretty cool. So I obviously use that because <laughs> it's our end. Yeah. Um, some other ones, some other just resources I use. I use, um, it's called Forecastly okay. for my like inventory management. So mm-hmm. it, you know, keeps track of all the products you're selling. It keeps track of the velocity, tells you when you have to reorder, things like that. So it's really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been using 
One of my favorite new tools that I feel like no one knows about is called uh, AMZ Split, mm. and it's split testing for Amazon listings. Um, so it's really cool because I can like change my price really from oh, that's 20 cool. to 22. It does it like every day on 24 hour rotation. And after two weeks, I might say, okay, like at the lower price, my profit's a little less, but the it made it up for it in the velocity. Right. Or, I could change keywords in my title and see if I started to sell more because I was ranking better and so yeah. forth. So it's really cool. I've actually been able to make quite a bit more money off just the exact same products by wow. optimizing them through split testing. Uh, so that's pretty neat. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so, for sharing uh, that. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, those. I think that's the uh, – for like accounting, I've been using um, – it's just called like wave apps. It's like a free accounting software. I think that's pretty much all I use on a day to day basis is do you do follow up emails with the, uh, do you do something for follow up emails and reviews to the Amazon people who purchase on Amazon? Yeah. Um, so I've been pretty bad about that. Um, just recently, actually we, we created our, do you have like jung, some- you have like jungle email now or what was <laughs> Well, uh, so I had something like in-house that I, that we were using yeah. and it was just because – so there's other services out there. There's like Feedback Genius, uh, Sales Backer, Feedbacks and so forth. Mm-hmm. But um, all of the emails that I was sending the customers were like really ugly. So mm-hmm. we actually like just – one of my programmers just spent like a half day writing like a really simple script that um, sends like these really pretty emails and like the call to action looks just like Amazon's buttons. So we were getting like – three times as many reviews wow. through like our own little that's system. That's amazing. Um, so now is so, that going to be another release of, of a software? I don't know. We we may want – I told some people about it and of course they're like, oh, you got to release it. But right. there's always lots on our plate, right? So, yeah. You have to decide we, on what you what you do. Yeah. So I don't know. If, if you listen to this in the future, Review Kick may do that. Um, if not, you can try out some of those other ones too. Like I said, like Sales Backer, Feedback Genius, Feedbacks with a Z on the end. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Cool. And so what about on the software side of things? What do you use to manage the team, software, you uh, know, question. bug development or whatever it is? Yep. So we use uh, Slack for um, instant communication mm-hmm. through the team. That's also, it's really also turned into like a news feed w- for our business with all of the integrations. Um, so we use uh, Bitbucket for uh, repositories for con- code control. Uh, we use Pivotal Tracker for managing um, technical tasks and bugs and so forth. Yeah. Um, let's see. And then we use Trello for managing marketing tasks. So like I said, uh, about Slack turning into a news feed, all those are integrated into Slack. So you can go yeah. into different channels and you can see like, oh, okay, um, Jared got done those three tasks on Pivotal Tracker today. I see he pushed the code up to Bitbucket. Um, it's it's waiting for QA right now, and then we'll push that code live to our production server, and we get a notification of that too. So um, yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, technology is awesome. <laughs> Greg, this is awesome. I really appreciate your time. And um, since it's the Commerce Mastery Series, I always ask, um, what's been the lowest point, and then what's been the proudest moment for you, business wise? So what's what's been the lowest point? Um. Uh, Man, it's like the past three years have been like going really well, just like growing. Um, yeah. So it's all been, you know, pretty like uphill. The lowest points, if I had to say like mentally, yeah, it would have been like when, and looking back, it was so silly, but at the time, you know, I just wasn't as mature of a thinker, would just be like on some of the times when I see like competition come out. And like at the time, mm. I would just feel like crushed, like so worried about it. And looking back, yeah. It was like the silliest thing ever, right? Like we used to like, sure, they may have taken a little bit of business, but if you just continue to grow, who really cares, right? Yeah. Um, so those would probably be like the lowest points like mentally. But like yeah, I but said, at the time, it does, it is, um, it does feel like a big blow. Yeah, you know, like, like you're not sure. It's like, man, what if they just like take start taking all my sales and everything just like seems doom and gloom, but it, yeah. Do you ever uh, worry that like, okay, let's say Google comes out with the same extension or they're watching what you're doing and they come out for free. Is there any of that like in your mind at all? Now I don't no. worry about it just because no. like I'm, I'm matured past that point. Yeah. And I think as long as you just continue to 
provide lots of value to your audience. Um, th there's forever a, a market for that. And, mm -hmm. you know, like I've learned the skills now how to successfully run businesses and manage people and um, develop successful e-commerce stores and so forth. That That's something that I can take with me forever. Even if even if Jungle Scout were to go out of business, whatever, you know, it's like I've learned these skills that are valuable for the rest of my life. Yeah. So what's been one of the proudest moments for you? Um, one of the proudest moments, um, let's see, like each time we release like a, a really big feature or something, um, that's usually, I'd say like the proudest, the proudest or like the highest moments because, you know, you work so hard on something and then it's finally released. Yeah. Um, so, for, so up to this point, everything's always just been like super positive for yeah. the feedback from these. So that just like feels so good um, yeah. when all your customers are like emailing you and tweeting you and stuff like, oh, this is the best thing ever. It makes my life so good. You know, like the, all the developers are really happy because they've worked, been working so hard on it. That's, those are probably the proudest times. What's been your favorite success story of someone using Jungle Scout? Uh, we get quite a few success stories. And that's yeah. like one of the things that like keeps pushing me on. Yeah. Um, sometimes, actually like just a couple weeks ago, um, I'm going to leave out – of some of the details, of yeah, kind of text versus privacy for sure, for sure. Yeah. But um, essentially, like here's their name, address, product, <laughs> no <on> Amazon. <laughs> no, but uh, man, it was like the it's one of like the nicest emails I've ever received. Essentially, yeah. they were just going through some like really tough times in life. I think uh, through separation, uh, dealing with like some really like uh, mental and like overweight type issues, hmm. and they they had found our case study and like used our product and helped them. Um, launched a successful product. I think they were even, I think maybe like on some government support before they've like gotten past that mm. uh, since then. And then that was like the very, so they probably would have been like at rock bottom then. That was like the very like uh, up, like beginning to like an uphill point. Since then they're like, man, I've started like uh, eating better and exercising and feeling good. And like they were feeling good about themselves. And it's like, mm. um, I never would have like guessed it. Like, you know, dude, like one, or a few like blog posts and a case study and like this tool that like we changed the trajectory of like an yeah. entire person's life. It's incredible, you know? Yeah. It's so, like looking back on things like that, it's like, wow, you know, it is it incredible. Feels really good to make these, the difference in people's lives yeah. like this. It gave them a little bit more motivation and positive yeah. outlook and that allowed them to change other aspects of their life. Right. All they needed was like that one little point. So wow. it's really cool. That's awesome. So yeah. Greg, that's, thank you for sharing that. Um, this has been amazing and I really appreciate your time on this. Um, and it's cause you could be touring Barcelona right now. Um, <laughs> where should we point people towards? Where should they check out online? Yeah. So if you want to find out more about jungle scout, um, uh, feel free to visit junglescout.com. I'm pretty active in the blog. Usually yeah. once or twice a week, we try to, um, Posts really good content on there, so that's a good place to find me. If you want to get in contact with me, uh, the best way is tweet me at uh, okay. at Mercer underscore Greg. Um, that's the uh, the quickest way to get a hold of me if you want to cool. tell me about something or meet up or whatever else. Yeah, Greg, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks again for having me on. I've enjoyed it. Take care.